Okay, uh, this evening is the uh, fourth day of August 2021, that is, and uh, I wanted to uh, share with you uh, a book tonight. Uh, just a, It's not going to be a long video. Uh, I've been rather busy today and yesterday, so I really don't have a super amount of energy, but I, um, I wanted to, t to talk tonight about... Um, Mr. Rose and uh, his uh, direct mind experience. Uh, this is the this is the book, and I'm going to read from it here. This is uh, on page 95. This is a uh, this is something he shared at a conference, not a conference, but he spoke at Boston College. Uh, probably in, I think it's 78. Maybe I'm wrong here. Um, this is probably his deepest work to me and the most challenging part about it. Actually, I'm wrong. It's 1975. Um, so let me uh, give some details about who I am and why I'm interested in truth. You see, I, uh, I grew up in the church. Uh, I live in the South. I live in South Carolina, and I can remember when I uh, went to school, I mean, went to church, and uh, at a country church in in the woods of uh, rural South Carolina, and I can remember uh, laying on my mom's lap uh, during the services, uh, they didn't have anything as children's church as well as I recollect. And if I misbehave, I would take it outside and get a spanking. So um, um, I'm guessing the age is three, maybe a little younger, maybe a little older. I don't know. So I grew up in the church all my life, believed in all the what they shared, even though um, I experienced some trauma at the age of four in a church in Athens, Georgia, when a uh, preacher uh, preached about hell and that we are going to hell. And it hit me and to a point that it, uh, I became fearful and cried. And that's one of the introductions to trauma. I'm sure there are other traumas even before this. Um, but anyway, that was what happened. Uh, at the age of eight years old, I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal savior at a church, uh, in a Baptist church that is an independent fundamentalist church. Very, um, uh, you know, there's not many preachers that preach the way they did back in the mid '60s, '70s type of thing. It was a kind of a hell and damnation type of um, approach of these speakers. Most of them were either, most of them were from Tennessee Temple or um, Bob Jones University perspective students. Um, they were what we what we called, there was not seminary students, that is, they were basically Bible colleges, both Tennessee Temple and, um, um, I forgot the name, but the one in Greenville, Bob Jones, named after Bob Jones were uh, liberal arts schools, and but they did train preachers to preach. So they preached that hell and damnation. And continue on and stayed in church for all my life. Uh, began to see some things, uh, started to mess with me at, in the mid, late night, um, late 80s. But I continued on, moved to Augusta, Georgia, and got involved in a Presbyterian church, was a singles leader of uh, men. Uh, led Bible studies usually every week, participated heavily in the church there, was a member. Even though I grew up in a Baptist church, I was down to Presbyterian church, which is a completely different ball game than a Baptist church. Uh, the church that I went to was the First Presbyterian Church of Augusta, which is a historical, major historical church. Uh, Woodrow Wilson's father pastored that church at one time in the 1860s, or afterwards, I should say, and then also is where the church was used as, a, as during the war was used as a um, uh, 
like a hospital to help out soldiers who had been um, wounded in the war, the war between the states. It was also the church where the organization began to um, to separate itself from its northern brethren. And I don't know if they ever got back together or not. That's another question you'll have to ask. But anyway, that's I don't want to get all in that. So my major turn through was basically in uh, the, the early 2000s and a seminary at Erskine Theological Seminary, which is, is, is a seminary in due west, South Carolina. The town has, I think, one stoplight or two. Uh, the reason why it's there simply is because the due west is there is simply because there's a seminary at a Erskine College is there, which is a ARP church, which stands for Associate Reformers Presbyterian Church. Uh, it tends to be somewhat conservative, um, more and more more conservative than uh, probably in lines with the PCA, which is the Presbyterian Church of America. And that's, uh, I had a particular professor who taught uh, early church history, which was called Patristic Period. And then I also took classes with him, the professor, um, a brilliant, brilliant professor, good, good, very good at early church history. Um, his name was Dr. Fairbairn. And then I took a class in Augustine, and that's when the wheels began to come off because I began to see things that didn't make sense. And I was trying to figure out why in the world was the reformer churches, that is the, the, the Presbyterians, that is later on with Calvin and also Luther as being a Lutheran church, were in, in alignment to their father, the church being a just as similar to the Catholics, meaning Roman Catholics being Augustine. And it all began to tie in. And um, no one knows what really goes on. 99.9999% of the people who go to church and who even actually participate in seminary, and even those who get a church history degree and, and get a master's in that and go on and become a professor, don't didn't see what I saw. Uh, I'm probably one of the few, if not only one, that saw what was going on. It took me some time to unravel it. But I discovered it basically, uh, it all ties in with Augustine, who never really left the whole idea of Manichaeism. Uh, that is the belief that Mani was the prophet in basically modern day Persia, per, well, it was in Persia, but modern day Iran. And that he saw the body as being bad and spirit being good. And that's where it all began. And he had an issue with. Uh, sex and he really never broke away from that you see um and he brought that into the church then he brought infant baptism in the church which is not even supported in scriptures it's usually to deal with what we would call adult baptism so and i know i'm going in a lot of detail here but i think it's still i need to lay the groundwork because people don't understand this and then eventually he has a uh, issues he has to deal with and it's a gentleman named Pelagius, which no one knows who he is because they burned his books. All we have is a couple books that are been saved by a professor in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and has written about him. It took a lot of guts to even write about him because simply as Pelagius is considered a arch heretic. Uh, he was he was a heretic. Uh, he was basically, this is how it works, folks. It's, I, it's, it's, it's how they decide elections and how they decide what goes into what we call doctrines and dogmas. And that is because a, sometimes all it takes is a simple majority saying, well, we don't approve, we don't agree with this. And that's it. Or uh, one particular person, the Pope, decides that he's a, he's a heretic type of thing. And so um, that's how it works. So, uh, so this is the whole idea of original sin, infant baptism. Then we have to have this special grace that comes from God. And then Jesus becomes sin in order for us to uh, become saved. You see, all this stuff is put together and it's all done with man's doctrines. And it actually sounds too good to be true because it is too good to be true. 
because you're responsible in how you live your life. It's not the, you know, grace only, you see. And that's what's taught not only at the uh, reform schools, that is seminaries, that is also taught at most Baptist seminaries now. So there are not any what we would call a perspective of you having some type of free will. That's all eliminated. So so here we go. This is a, a quote. This is going to go from what I call from um, 95 when um, Richard Rose is here. And it's, I, it's the relative dimension. And the question simply is, is that Rose did something really which is interesting. He always allowed the audience to participate if, as long as they were asked good questions relevant to what he was sharing. And so this is this is what he's about. So why are we caught up in this relative world? Is there any value to it? And then Rose calls, talks back and says, this is the catch. When I was about 21 years of old, I tried to write a poem about this. The theme was, why am I on this path? This too is implanted. It had to be. In other words, uh, Rose is saying something pretty deep here. So hear me out. I'm not an individual that says suddenly I'm going to get rid of these hangups and barnacles to be a free individual. I had to be almost programmed to look for the truth. So he's saying someone was guiding him. Some Something was leading him to truth, you see. Because Rose had a desire for the truth. But someone or some entity was protecting him and helping him. Now, what does this mean? In esoteric or spiritual writings, you hear words like, we have lost our way from the Father, that each particle wants to go back to the, far, to the Father. This is what I meant when I said that everybody's looking for the truth. I don't like, I'm sorry, I don't like to say it in such a religious sounding way that would have a listener think, well, this is just a belief. This is the foundation that you have. This is the feeling that you get when you go back there, that you went back to the Father, that you had lost your way, so to speak, because your consciousness has become fascinated. I was talking earlier today about one of my grandchildren, a baby. The baby isn't totally in this dimension at this age. And that's to do with the whole idea of your essence, your innocence at that time period in your life. The problem, the so sad part is the sad part is that most of us don't remember that. I did come across someone on Facebook today who does remember this. If she's telling the truth, uh, I is radical in a lot of ways, but she does remember certain things. Uh, what happened? So obviously, she's uh, if I understand, she's still connected to source or she's essence herself. That's some, you know. Anyway, the baby isn't totally in this dimension at this age. It will come. It will only come into this dimension for a time. And I realize that what you have to do to keep a baby in this dimension is to keep its attention. If you leave that child alone and let it be, there's a good there's a good opportunity that child will stick into its essence. But the problem is, you're trying to. You see, it's, it's connected to source when it comes from your, from your mom's womb. That's what Rose is saying here. What he's saying simply is, is that the child is in its own world, in its own home thing, and, and, and really is actually doesn't have any desire to be in your world. As long as you feed it, drink, you know, such and such, it gets the rest type of thing. And so the point here is this, is that parents, educators later on, but parents is immediately think they've got to get that child's attention as though to prepare them to be an adult later on. So the blind is leading the blind, so to speak. That is, the parents think this is what they need to do because this is what happened to them, you know, and this is what happened to them before, so-and-so.
you neglect that baby and it will die. Well, of course it will die. Right? That's the point, simply feeding it, you know, washing it, um, cleaning diapers, whatever you would call it, everything. But the point simply is, is that he's talking about getting its attention. You know, like, for example, you know, ring. The, you remember these, the keys that, you know, they would do this in front of you as, a, as you was in the cradle or not cr yeah, cradle in the bed, such and such as a baby. And they would make these noises trying to get your attention. Your parents did that, not knowing what they were doing. It is said that if you let a monkey lay and don't give him something that is like a mother or a friend, he will close in on itself and die. He just retreats into the, to the other dimension, you see. That's what they're saying. So what do we do with our babies? We make crazy noises at them. We talk baby talk to them and try to attract that baby's attention. We sing songs to it and keep dangling toys in front of it. Finally, the baby starts watching what is in front of it and becomes enchanted by it. The next thing you know, he's exploring the whole room and pretty soon he is hooked. Question. What are your views on reincarnation? First of all, if I knew for sure that you were going to reincarnate, I wouldn't tell you. Because I believe that it becomes a form of procrastination. He's right. Those who believe in reincarnation never really, they put it off. Not understanding that the day is the day of salvation. And I'm not talking about preachers. I'm talking about simply is you need to pursue it. You need to pursue truth. There may be cases where people have realized that they have lived before or that they have been on the stage before or something of this sort. But this idea of reincarnation can be used for several purposes. It can be used by the powers of that particular area, area to tell the person, don't feel bad because I'm stealing all your money. The next time around, you will be in charge and you will be stealing my money. <laughs> you see. Or the reason that you are here is that you stole my money last time. This is one rationalization connected with the theory of reincarnation. And the other rationalization is, of course, you got all the time in the world. Yeah. No, we don't have all the time. Nothing's guaranteed that you'll be awake tomorrow. This cosmos turns slowly and in time you'll get there. Question. You talk about the different levels of our being. Are there... Are these like stages of development? Yes. It seems pretty hard to make a jump, although there seems to be people who have possibly been born with a certain faculty that other people were not born with. They seem to jump a bit faster. Now, what he's talking about here is to do with what Gertrude has shared in the past and uh, what we would call uh, the pyramid type of deal which most people see that to do with uh, those who rule this world. This, this, this manifestation is taking place. But in reality, simply is uh, it could be also be looked at as the foundation at, at the bottom. In the bottom, Gertrude would say it's instinctive. So all you're looking for is to have food, shelter, have sex, have a family, and, and lo and behold, produce kids, and keep your family name type of thing. That's pretty much that whole perspective. The next step is you move. It's a lot less people in that particular deal, and suddenly is to do with the emotions, and a lot of it has to do with religion. Uh, you come to the realization that you need a savior, such, such and such, but you're looking on the outside of yourself, not, not internally. So this is a smaller number of people than the whole foundation, you see. And he goes on. The third step is a significant step because simply is, is this is when you become, um, you are what we call not a, um, you're uh, intellectual. You, you begin to pick up books and you start reading books. And you, I'm looking for truth here, looking for something. Why am I here? This asking escogetical state state uh, questions is, you know, what's the purpose of my life? Uh, is it just simply to get a job and go to school? You know, 
uh, just to provide for my needs for the future. At one point, colleges uh, used to do what we would call uh, teach you a different perspective. That's all changed. I was on the last part of it in the late 70s, early 80s. Is it what I saw was the area of computer science was coming in in the in the 80s. And engineering was becoming a primary deal instead of actually getting a what we call a well-defined um, perspective of education. You know, the, in sciences, in arts, in history, and many other things out there that would would give you a more uh, good foundation. That's pretty much gone now. It's, it's become basically, colleges have become basically groundwork for you to go to work. That's what it's about, you see. you getting a four-year degree, and then you go to get a, pursue something in engineering, depending on what type of engineer you want to go into. And then you do what they call um, management upper level management, that type of thing. So it's no longer what we call it getting a well-grounded education anymore. So sometimes it happens a long life of spiritual work and you will notice it happening to them on their deathbeds. So in other words, people wake up a little too late. They realize that their life has been uh, wasted in, in ways that simply is that they, um, they played around too much, uh, pursued their all their interests, so to speak, and now they realize that they're they're going to die soon or die in the near future. You see, do you see these states of being as as able to coexist at the same time and be constant? They do. For example, if you reach the salvationistic experience, you never completely lose it, and you don't have to lose it as you go along. You can't. You don't deny it, even if you find that it isn't the final experience. So he's saying something, yeah, you, you go through it such and such, you don't forget it. In other words, when a person has a salvational type of experience, that to him is the maximum experience and everybody else is crazy. Yeah, at that level, you you do see that. But that's not, you're, you're not at the top, folks. You see, the next step, like I said, after the emotions is to do with what we call intellectual. And in the fourth, what simply is, is to be philosophical. You begin to work in the area of developing your own philosophy on life. Only when they transcend the into, into instinctive level can they still be an instinctive person, recognizing the values of instinctive living, the energy that comes from instinctive living, and be now on an emotional level, and then still be an intellectual person, recognizing that it is a, a vanity, while becoming a philosophical person, and still go on from there. Part of the system that I advise in the Algevin papers is that we make milk from thorns. So let me let me uh, give you a definition of what does that mean when he says milk from thorns. This is related to curiosity and desire and to transmutation. The deliberate using of some of the forces and urges being projected through us by nature for mundane purposes for our own ends, which require this extra energy and impetus. So this is uh, like, you know, there's pressure and you you actually get something from a thorn. You, there's a, a, a milk substance, like you would say, from that. Because you have a desire to go in that direction. And this is, this is the one he talks about. The very thing, these very things which are negative can be turned around. The energy taken from them and this energy used in progression in finding goals further. So it's, a, it's kind of a wake up call. Uh, some of it could be what we call maybe traumas in some ways to get a, a wake up call also. And that it actually allows you to grow faster. Question When you reach the point where the physical world and time become unreal in a way, when practical life loses its value and doesn't matter, it can become pretty difficult. Yes, he says, I know, and I know that. The only thing I can say is to try to keep yourself chemically balanced. That's all. You can handle it if you don't become unbalanced chemically. 
So he goes on here. It's the next section called God, Buddhism, and Christianity. The question is, do you believe that there is a God? I don't believe that the God that people talk about is this. Where, okay, the next question, where does Jesus Christ fit in? Was he somebody who attained enlightenment? Well, I don't really know that. I believe that there were people who lived on earth who had a great potential, and somehow, sometimes, writings are misread, and I don't pretend to know what they know. Buddha wrote nothing. Christ wrote nothing. But we find say, three Gospels written almost identical at time when printing was it was expensive. You know, and I'm somewhat dubious about this idea of wasting the time in the writing of three almost identical Gospels. And yet, this book gives us the formula. And I said, you will find formulas in sacred writings. In my particular case, I got disgusted with the whole Christian movement for a while. I ignored the formula therein and then came back and discovered them. For instance, the way, the truth, and the life is a good biblical formula for any seeker. The paths to truth are threefold in both Buddhism and Christianity. The formula is the way, the truth, and the life. You don't just work on one thing. You have to work on three levels at once. In Buddhism, it is the Buddha, the drama, and the Sangha. Both formulas are pretty much synonyms. Drama means way, and the Sangha is the brotherhood. You have to become the truth, you must apply the discipline, and you must be associated with a brotherhood. That's the life in the Christian context. That's true. That's why um, Christians fellowship together in the churches, and they study the Bible. The truth, of course, is the central thing. Christ said, I am the truth. Now, he says, I am the truth. He also says, I am the way and the life. This implies that he too became, he had to become, he didn't learn. So he had to progress and teach himself. He may have studied with somebody such as the Essenes, but basically his admonition was, admonition was to become. He didn't say, I learned the truth. He says, I am the truth. This was a distinction. Not exactly whether he did say this or not, whether or not somebody just wrote it down, I don't know. That somebody might have said, well, we like that fellow. He was in our club. Let's make him the Messiah. This argument has been presented, and I don't like to rule on it. I say to, say to find out for yourself, basically, or to try to find somebody who's living and has gone through some experience and talk to them. It may do you more good than trying to live according to a code of someone whom somebody else has written about. And then he goes on another question here simply is, is uh, I take it that you don't believe in God. And he says, that's correct. Don't get me wrong. I believe that the enlightenment experience is the same as the God experience. But I like to qualify this because the term God is generally used with certain implications. You see, the whole word God um, is, is a, um, I always ask this question, and, and Christians don't seem to understand it. And it's simply, why does God have has the necessity of being worshipped? Isn't he God? Why does he have to have others to worship him? makes no sense because he's God. Why would he have a need or desire to be worshipped? He is already who he is. If he is God, he would not have to have any adoration from others to make him feel worthy. When reality, if he is God, he's he has no void in him. He is completely God. And yet, this is what is taught. And so you realize suddenly, and you have to understand where all these things start with is simply that thinking that we've got to create a God. And the same thing is simply is if you've got that, then you're going to have to create a devil. And there's that's dualism. That's duality. That's where it comes from. You know, it's just like a movie. Um, oh, you have a, what is it called? You have a protagonist in the movie and you have an antagonist. Same thing. You have a good guy and a bad guy. 
especially in um, back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, we had what you call detective movies or you had westerns. And they always were, were put out simply as you have a good guy and you have a bad guy, you see. You have antagonists against the protagonist who's trying to do what's right. So, <clears throat> God is thought of as a being a mind, a perfect divine mind, is what the question is. Well, yes, but there is a concept that reaches beyond that. There is an intermediate stage that you enter after death, and that is mind, the, the mind division, the mind dimension, I'm sorry. Mary Baker Eddy discovered that they, this exists, possibly by studying some Eastern philosophy and calling it the universal mind. In other words, in your individual mind, you have your own private thoughts. But nevertheless, your mind functions at its best when it is in contact with the mind dimensions. Some sects in India call this the Buddhi mind. Paul Brunton called it the over-self, of which we are all a part, like the Brahman, so to speak. So this is a, um, a thought here. And let's go back to here. This is where we all live, and I'll explain to you this because we, we don't. This is where uh, the struggles are always in you. It's to do with your thoughts, your private thoughts, and what goes on within you is where your suffering takes place. This is where you get the makeup of who you are and what you think of yourself. So this is a entire so this is, is an entirely different concept of God than the guy with the big whiskers that sits up there and says, Hey, you're getting out of line down there. You broke a rule. Another question. Are you saying that God is a universal mind? No, I don't say that God is even universal mind. I think that the absolute is the stage beyond mind. The mind is a dimension. And you discover that the mind is a dimension by losing the mundane mind. The individual mind, the mundane mind, gives way, and you realize that you don't that you don't have an individual mind. That is mostly just contact with mind stuff, so to speak. So this is uh, something um, I wanted to share with you tonight. Again, I didn't want to go a long time on this particular area, and this is from his book, Direct Mind Experience. Now. The key with what Rose is sharing here is that his own search for truth. And many are today uh, are not even aware of where they're at, even spiritually. And almost, well not, I wouldn't even say the majority, the vast majority is still at the instinctive level and that m most are there and most people are still there. Um, you know, they're there. And one of the things he talks about Rose does here is that <clears throat> he, he doesn't like the word reincarnation. And I agree. It just reincarnation. And I've changed my views in this perspective because I come to the view that simply is that at one time, the church was in it and it was actually in, was part of it. In other words, the whole idea of the Council of Nicaea and on to the councils until later in the 500s, there was the thought that we all reincarnate here. And many in the Eastern world believe in reincarnation certain ones, certain groups. But I come to define out simply is this, what Rose is saying simply is people make excuses. The other idea simply is if, if you say you get to the age of what we call, um, this is why it's so important that you understand what Gertrude talks about. See, Rose is building his system, uh, yes, on his own, but he does borrow ideas from, Kirchhoff and Ospensky. And Gertrude 
would be what we would call, he called it a work. But Goethe was wrong in some ways, and that is in his perspective, that is Rose. He was speaking about physical work so that it would cause your mind to be at peace or still. And Rose would not agree with that. He's, he, he took a step further than that. So he knew there was another way of quieting the mind instead of always, it's always chatting all the time because it's, 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 a, it's a fear factor, you see. This was not in children's minds in the past, uh, early age essence. There was, as far as we know, since there was no fear there until the child left its essence and be, suddenly was now accepted into this world. I asked a lot of questions today simply is to, you know, for on Facebook. Part of that is simply is to ask myself those questions for my own uh, benefit, but also for others to realize simply is, so so why am I here? You know, did, did I choose to come here? What's my purpose? You know, did I, am I, you know, what is, what, what you know, is I'm here for a certain purpose? And then he goes, and we can go back with Rose simply is until you get to the point of the step four on the pyramid, you're going to start over again in the future sometime. So the whole idea is to get to step four. If not, you know, I don't know if you call it reincarnation or whatever you want to call it. I wouldn't say that because reincarnation gets the idea somehow in my mind, and maybe it's not with you, that, well, you got step one or two, so the next time you come in, you'll, you'll hold on to that. And that's not what Rose is, holds on to. He says, basically, you start at square one again. I think it's one of the things that's so pertinent about this whole thing is mothers in the physical realm and in the spiritual realm. If you could keep your children, that is, not try to get their attention, it's a possibility that they would go and stay in their essence longer. And especially with the technology today, you could actually record what the child says. You see, and you could play that back through at a later date and say, this is what you said in the past. Do you still believe that or understand that type of thinking? You know, like I know I've had deep conversations with a woman when she uh, had her child herself at home. She chose to do this because she understood that the system is the hospital. She understood that that's how they rob you of your child. The government does and puts them on a roll. And next thing you know, when they get a certain age and when they volunteer for Social Security, then they are in the system and it's, it become, they don't even know it. It's a fictional world. So the, the mother's done this. And so my, my thinking simply, if you could do that, keep that child so you don't get attention and dangling the keys and trying to get such and such out of them, then that child has a greater possibility of not. And also the child, when it's not in the system, is not forced to go to compulsive school. You see. That child is free. And I don't understand why women don't want to see this. You know, I don't know if they'd even understand. This whole predicament we're in is only 150 years old at the most. That is the hospital system. And, and, and likely it is not even 150 years, but maybe close to it. Um, especially in cities or doctors, such and such and hospitals that were maybe in cities at certain, certain times. And the other thing simply is, is that a lot of people still in the country, even in the 1920s and 1910s, still had their children in the house. But they went out and volunteered and got a birth certificate. That's how the skin the whole thing. Yes, this is a physical system, but also it also ties in spiritually, you see. And so, you know, it's so important if mothers understood the validity of where they're at and understand simply is 
Let's go back to the old way. Let's have kids at home. Let's have a midwife and let's have children this way so that the state has no control of this child or not volunteer and get a birth certificate. I think uh, those who did this, uh, have done this to mankind are, are, are really desperate people who prey upon people. They're what I call entities. You either have entities within yourself. There's what I would call a spiritual world. Uh, it deals with your mind. And then on the physical level where we're at, you have entities that are always trying to steal your energy and you're just, you're just trying, just trying to survive. Part of the reason why it's that way simply is that uh, there was a big change in society as we've gone to becoming more civilized when reality is the, the oxymoron. We're not civilized today, but we call it that. Civilization is though it's a, a marquee step forward when it's actually a step backward. And so we didn't progress, but part of that simply was that people lived on farms. They were far more self-sufficient in that regard. The only thing they had to depend upon was the weather. And naturally, these were religious people, and they prayed for rain, that type of thing. I understand that part, and it was a tolling deal. I'm not saying it was easy. I'm not saying anything of that nature. But the point simply was they wasn't dependent upon a system, a government, you see. They were self governed even at that point. Even in this country, even though the, there was a constitution going on and being written about and all this stuff like that, they were still outside that system. You see, unless you went to a um, church that we would call deals with infant baptism, then there was a possibility of that. And when all that, when we saw the religions begin to wane, the infant baptism was waning. Then they introduce other ways of actually getting your child into the system. But see, they, this has all been a step-by-step -step approach type of thing. When they inter instituted government schooling, that should have been the red flag there when you uh, put your child and when you started that. And we do know that there were protests against government schooling. And let me point out something. Why would the government be involved in schooling? because simply as they would propagandize your child. They're not educating your child. It's a, prop, it's a form of propaganda. That's what it is. Simple as basic as that. Yes, they put in certain things and people really fall for this. They really fall. You could actually self-educate yourself now. You can educate yourself now, period. Especially with the onset of a computer programming, you can not programming, but actually languages, all this stuff can be done. You don't even have to have the system anymore. You don't have to have the educational system. You see, we they've already proven it, you know, and I'm not in agreement with what I call computers, which was introduced also with the students. But this is the a way of that. Also simply is, is that unschooling, the child's bright enough to himself to discover what he likes and enjoys. So it pursues stuff. It enjoys. There's nothing wrong with that. That's why you enjoy life. You do certain things. That's why you don't want to be a, you know, you know, you don't want to be a, someone who drives and I'm not putting someone down driving a dump truck all your life, such and such, you see, or get a CDL, what they call it, commercial driver's license. And that's all you do all your life. What, what boring life is that? It's just like a robot, you see? And now it's even more mechanical, you see? Anyway, I've gone way beyond what I wanted to share tonight, but I wanted, well, not beyond what I want to share, but this simply is a lot longer time wise. So I wish you a good night and I appreciate you listening. Uh, again, I'm open for questions here. Uh, I'm sharing what I know is the truth. And I thank you for listening and you have a good night. Thank you.